stick around because we'll now turn things over to Julie Clegg, who will be presenting on law enforcement challenges, challenges in combating human trafficking during the current international crisis. Don't forget to ask your questions in the chat. Take it away, Julie. All right, thank you so much, Brianna, uh, much appreciated. So I'm just gonna share my screen here. Um, All right, uh, so it's it's great to be here and I'm really excited. This is a subject that as a lot of people know, I'm, I'm extremely passionate about and it is um, fortunately gaining more um, recognition at the moment. People are talking about human trafficking more. Uh, we're talking about the issues around it. Um, it is being recognized as being a significant crime. Um, not many people realize though, that this is actually uh, the second largest organized crime uh, genre in the world. Um, people don't really recognize that the problem is as big as it is. And so my purpose today, my aim really is to raise awareness uh, to educate around what is human trafficking, trafficking in persons, what, how does it differ from migrant smuggling? What does it mean, uh, you know, what are the different um, types of human trafficking, what behavior do you see, and why do victims not come forward. So I will take questions at any time throughout the presentation, so if you have a question, uh, post it in the chat or fire it over to, uh, to Brianna or, or Anna or anybody else who's moderating questions, and I'll answer those as we go along, uh, just in case there's no time for questions at the end. So it is considered to be um, in all areas of the world, a global epidemic. Uh, we are in the middle of a pandemic, obviously, and that has changed the way that human trafficking and traffickers behave. And you may expect that because we're talking about trafficking, we're talking about the movement of people around the world, uh, across borders, internationally, that human trafficking and um, modern slavery may have slowed or diminished. And in fact, the opposite is true we're seeing an exponential increase in the growth of human trafficking and human trafficking cases as a result of the pandemic. It has changed um, the, the dynamics of human trafficking. It's changed the types of exploitation that we're seeing on the back of that trafficking. And in fact, if you look at uh, this figure here on this slide, so as of July, 2020, it was estimated there were approximately 25 million victims globally of human trafficking. That number now, as of April 2021, is believed to be over 40 million. So we are seeing an extreme rise in the number of people being trafficked. And the reason for that in a global pandemic is, uh, there's a number of different reasons. One of them is the, the services available to victims are fewer. Uh, victims are harder to identify because they're not going out and about. So they're not being recognized. They're being kept more enclosed. And it's really pushed the whole idea of sexual exploitation, forced labor underground. There's really nowhere for these people to go and escape. Uh, law enforcement resources are being um, directed elsewhere in the pandemic. There's so much more for police and, and other law enforcement uh, teams to do than to focus on human trafficking or to try and recognize human trafficking when we are in the middle of a pandemic and, and those numbers are just being stretched so thin. Uh, so lots of reasons why uh, we're seeing this massive increase in traffic, trafficked persons uh, and modern slavery as well. Something that uh, really needs to be addressed and I, and I will talk about this later in the presentation is the ratio of uh, victims, traffickers being arrested and traffickers being prosecuted. And it depends on where you are in the world. Um, so in January this year, I was down in El Salvador and I was meeting with the United Nations down there to talk about their issues, uh, particularly in the Northern Triangle um, around human trafficking, modern slavery, sex tourism, forced labor, and um, particularly child sex trafficking in those regions. And uh, the, you know, geography plays a massive part in how effective we are at detecting victims of human trafficking, how effective we are in prosecuting that, 
Uh, a lot depends on government. It depends on levels of corruption. It depends on the skills and training of law enforcement and whether or not specialized units exist in certain countries to deal with um, human trafficking. Here in Canada, we actually only have in two of our provinces, or, or should I say only two of our provinces have special prosecution teams for dealing with human trafficking. And that's in a, in a first world country that's highly developed and where law enforcement has a reasonable amount of training. Um, and there's only two provinces that actually have special prosecution teams uh, in respect of this, even though Canada has made it a priority to deal with human trafficking and is doing fairly well. And we'll have a look at that uh, a little bit later. So the first thing I wanna do is just explain what human trafficking is. Uh, uh, there is some confusion as to what would constitute human trafficking. So really there has to be three elements or there are three elements to trafficking in persons. The first one being there must be an action of some kind. The actions that you see here, so the traffickers must commit one or more of the following acts. Uh, recruiting, transporting, transferring, harboring, receiving, giving or receiving a benefit or control. Now you'll notice that there isn't a requirement in human trafficking for somebody to be moved from one place to another. So again, people have a misconception that when you're trafficked, you are taken from one place to another, um, either across a border or to a different place, to a different city or a different town. That does not have to be the case for trafficking. You can just harbor somebody. It can be purely recruitment. So you can be um, a teenage girl recruiting other teenage girls for a trafficker and you can still fulfill um, the role of being a trafficker yourself. So a misconception that I really want to address here is that for trafficking to be um, the complete offense, you don't actually have to physically move somebody from one place to another. So somebody can still be living at home, a young girl or a young boy or uh, an adult um, that's a fruit picker, uh, all of those people can be being trafficked without actually having been moved from one place to another. So, so the means, there has to be one of the following means of controlling that person. Um, so violence or threats of violence, coercion, abduction, fraud, deception, abuse of power, um, or a position of vulnerability. So again, this may be somebody, this may be control by the use of removing somebody's documents so they can't leave the country. It can be by threats, so um, taking uh, photographs of somebody and then threatening them with those photographs unless they do a certain thing. And those things, those certain things are under the purpose. So that would be, these are typically the purposes of human trafficking. So sexual exploitation is the one that really most of us think about when we think about human trafficking is sex trafficking um, and particularly child sex trafficking. Uh, that's the most controversial version of this and gets the most attention. But there is also forced labor, uh, slavery, um, servitude, so domestic, ser uh, domestic servitude, bringing somebody into your home, having them live under violence or threats of violence or removing their documents or papers so they cannot leave, uh, taking away their means of communication, threatening their family, um, committing some kind of fraud to keep them in that place, um, having them commit some kind of criminal act so that they are now effectively bonded to their trafficker because if they are to go out and call the police, they themselves risk being arrested and potentially deported. Um, organ removal, not so much uh, an issue in Canada, but certainly in many other countries, people are um, trafficked under the guise of something, uh, possibly uh, migration, voluntary migration, for the purposes of having their organs harvested and forced labor or services. So that really is what human trafficking looks like. And it must uh, meet all three of those um, different parameters. There must be an act, a means, and a purpose. And it can be any combination of those things. So you can recruit somebody using fraud um, for domestic servitude. Uh, you can harbor somebody in a place using um, deception 
for the purposes of sexual exploitation. So, and, and any number of those combinations. So um, hopefully that will help people get more of a sense of what human trafficking is. And then I just wanna talk about the difference between trafficking and smuggling. So people, uh, so everybody that's watching is aware and can understand this is, this is the biggest question that I typically get is how does migrant smuggling different, differ from human trafficking? And the biggest thing to remember is that trafficking typically um, under most circumstances does not include informed consent. Smuggling typically includes informed com consent. Now, there's a number of other uh, more nuanced parts to that. And we'll go through smuggling first. Um, smuggling typically involves somebody that wants to go to another place, another country for, the, for a better life. That's typically how smuggling uh, starts or in many cases, it may well be that somebody is coerced into being smuggled. It may well be that they are, um, that they are smuggled because uh, there's a threat or um, they owe somebody some money. Those things are trafficking. That's not consent. Consent is when you go to somebody, you pay some money, you say, I want to go to Canada because um, somebody's offered me some work there. And you pay money and you go to that place. And the smuggling, the offense of smuggling ends when the, when the person reaches that destination. Now, that's not to say that at that point, exploitation doesn't begin. And you may go from having a smuggling situation right into a trafficking situation and an exploitation situation but the smuggling ends when the destination is reached or when that, or death, uh, which, which often occurs for smugglers uh, for, or for people being smuggled. So think of smuggling more as a transaction, a consensual transaction often involving money or debt bondage. So debt bondage being uh, the promise of, you know, I will pay you back when I get to that place, um, you know, you can have my first years of paychecks or you can have all of my paychecks until I, um, you know, make enough money and pay off that debt. That will typically push somebody into exploitation and will potentially then turn into trafficking. But uh, smuggling, typically transactional, typically transnational, so uh, you, of an international nature or at least crossing a border of some kind, um, and then will go and then the smuggling ends. Trafficking is typically when there is uh, no consent or consent is uh, withdrawn or consent is not informed. So this is anything with coercion, threats, uh, debt bondage may uh, shift smuggling into trafficking. Um, there is no physical movement required with trafficking. As we saw in the previous slide, you can just harbor somebody, you can just recruit somebody and it meets the definition of trafficking. You don't necessarily need to move somebody from one place to another. Now, if somebody is moved from one place to another, from another province or another city, if that is non-consensual or it is consensual under coercion or threat, then it still is trafficking, not smuggling. So having that understanding is important. Trafficking is a means to an end. It's not the end. Smuggling is, takes you to the end. So trafficking is a means of exploitation. It's a means of taking somebody or holding somebody for the purposes of victimization. And the person in this case is the commodity. So in a smuggling situation, the money, uh, the transaction is the, um, the commodity. So the money, the person is taking that person and transporting them. In this case, the person is the commodity. So this is this just demonstrates where to and from people are typically uh, smuggled. So this is migration and smuggling. So again, when we talk about migration or smuggling, slightly different again as well. So migration is where somebody may go voluntarily. They may fly to another country by themselves, not be smuggled. Um, so they may uh, go to the border and get themselves through the border. They may pay somebody to help get them through, 
Um, and again, there's a fine line there between smuggling and migration, but that line exists based on how that transaction is done, but again, is different to trafficking. So when we talk about migration for forced labor or, exploita or exploitation, this may start off as voluntary migration, again, leading to uh, forced labor or exploitation. So we can see that in North America, most people uh, that migrate into North America for the purposes of forced labor or exploitation or are brought here, um, me being in North America, uh, from it, um, the Asia Pacific region and also from South America, Central America, uh, sometimes via the United States, sometimes um, via the Atlantic Ocean. If we look through Europe, uh, we can see the movement there from Eastern to Western Europe. The orange or brown colored arrows show the likelihood of people being repatriated back to their country of origin from those locations. So in South America, people are typically repatriated back to North Africa or the Middle East um, and Asia. And then in um, between Europe, so going from um, Eastern to Central Europe, people are typically repatriated back to Eastern Europe. Um, that being said, when we look at migration and we look at trafficking, 74%, certainly in Canada, 74% of people that are trafficked in Canada are Canadians. So there is only a very small percentage of people, less than 25%, of people that are trafficked into Canada for the purposes of exploitation. So again, there is often a misconception, uh, particularly when we think about issues around immigration and those types of issues or people coming into a country to work. Um, that might be the case, but people that are being exploited in, in certain regions are typically within that country. So 75% or almost 75% of people being exploited in Canada are Canadians. When we look at uh, smuggling and trafficking legislation, uh, there is again, this, uh, the piece on the bottom here. So no person shall knowingly organize the coming into Canada of one or more persons by means of abduction, fraud, deception, or use of threats of force or coercion. So this is from the Immigration and Refugee Protection Act. Um, and that has recently established a separate offense of human trafficking or human smuggling and trafficking. So that's the definition, uh, the Canadian definition of um, what that means in relation to human smuggling and trafficking. So um, for everybody's awareness there. So who are these victims? And we're talking about trafficking now. So moving away from smuggling or migration, these are who the victims are. Um, and they're not necessarily who you would expect. When you think of human trafficking, you may not think of farm workers or fruit pickers. Uh, this is domestic help, um, nail technicians, car wash attendants. So these hand car wash type places, um, anywhere where, tra where transactions are uh, done in cash are often places where people will be exploited. Anywhere that uses typically foreign workers, um, and there's certain signs to look out for. If, if these people look extremely disheveled, if they look malnourished, if they don't appear to be in receipt of their own documents, if, they, if everybody's getting on a bus every day and being taken to a certain place and then put back on a bus at the end of the day and taken to another place, if they're living in squalor or terrible conditions, if they don't have freedom, if they appear to be scared or nervous or worried, if they have physical bruises or marks on their bodies. All of these are signs of different types of victimization. And although we believe that sex trafficking is the biggest form of human trafficking, and again, the one that gets the most attention, in actual fact, it's forced labor that is the largest percentage. So it's important that people realize, and particularly law enforcement, that Forced labor can occur in any environment. It can be somebody that's been forced to work for a very wealthy family um, in downtown Vancouver. It can be uh, farm workers, people that have been brought into Canada or are here legitimately 
on a work visa for a certain period of time and then have been kept longer than their visa or have been kept here, um, you know, the purpose was to send money home for their family. Their money is all being taken away because they're being forced to pay uh, for the privilege of working. They have lost their freedom. They are now being exploited and trafficked. They are modern slaves. Uh, construction sites and construction workers, again, another huge problem when it comes to forced labor. Uh, you see quite a lot of people that are working in these um, quite unstructured uh, agreements. And these can often be done through recruitment agencies um, that are fake. So fake recruitment agencies, fake websites, fake people, um, fake friends on social media being forced to entice other people uh, based on the needs of the trafficker. So this is how uh, globally human trafficking is assessed and how we measure um, the, where, we, where we all stand in terms of our efforts country-wise to protect citizens and to control human trafficking. So Canada is considered tier one. Now these tiers are set by um, the Trafficking Victim Protections Act. Uh, this is by the US State Department. And this is the minimum standard that countries have to meet. And we'll have a look at this on the next slide. Um, this isn't all the countries. This is all I could fit on the slide to make it readable. But there are three tiers in terms of human trafficking response. So Canada is in tier one, but Canada is minimally meeting the minimum requirements for um, the protection of people being trafficked, the protection of trafficking victims. There is an awful lot more that we could and should be doing to protect victims of human trafficking. And we'll talk about that a little later on. And you can go to this, on my last slide here, I cite all of the information that's in this presentation and I'm happy to share this presentation with anybody that would like it. All of the sources of information are on the final slide. So you'll be able to see where this information comes from. Go and have a look at where your country falls within um, within this list and see what the recommendations are for uh, each country in terms of what needs to be done, both from law enforcement perspective, from a prosecution's perspective, and from a social justice perspective to start to uh, help assist victims of crime or victims of um, human trafficking. So these are what the tiers look like. Um, and I'll show you on the next slide, we won't read it in detail because you can see the, the legislation and, uh, and how that looks. So tier one, um, where Canada falls, the United States and many uh, first world countries. Uh, these are countries and territories whose governments are fully complying with the Act's minimum standards. Canada is consistently minimally complying uh, and we always have been. Uh, same with the United States, same with the United Kingdom. Um, so tier two, these are countries and territories whose governments are not fully complying, uh, but they are making significant efforts to comply um, with the minimum standards. Then there's a tier two watch list. So again, this is uh, countries and territories whose governments are not fully complying with the minimum standards, but they're making significant efforts. Um, but there's a couple of caveats here. So the estimated number of victims of severe forms of trafficking is very significant. Uh, or is significantly increasing, and the country isn't taking proportionate uh, measures or actions to deal with the fact that they have an exponential problem that's growing and they're not yet minimally meeting standards. Um, and then B, there's a failure to provide evidence of an increasing effort to combat severe forms of trafficking uh, in persons from the previous year. So these are people that, or these are countries and nations that are not meeting the standard, have a growing exponential problem and are not showing the required minimum effort to combat that problem um, on a year by year basis. And then uh, tier three is countries and territories whose governments do not comply with minimum standards and are not really making any effort to do so. And um, those are countries, if you go and look at that list that you would, uh, in fact, we'll go back if we can. Um, the tier three countries um, you can see are uh, there's some countries on there that you would probably expect to see and, um, and, and countries that you may not. And it may come down to budgets, it may come down to the priorities of the countries, 
that they have other priorities. Some of this will also come down to cultural issues. Um, again, being down um, in the Northern Triangle and meeting with the United Nations in January, I, I spoke to um, a number of people down there and of course, you've got Guatemala, El Salvador, and Honduras. And Honduras is a very difficult country to, um, to talk about human trafficking with. Some of that is because of the natural disasters, same with Guatemala, that they have suffered. And so the governments have other priorities. Um, and another element of that is a cultural element. Uh, there are certain areas, uh, you see these areas in Africa, uh, in other um, countries all over the world where there are there are still tribal issues where there are certain matters of honor there are certain matters of tribal justice tribal um ways of dealing with certain types of crime that the government uh work with um certain tribes and certain leaders to try and circumvent but there are issues with that so you know some of that comes down to geography all we can do is in our own um in our own part of the world and and where we can take control is be aware of these issues and be aware um of what's happening so i'm not going to read this slide i just wanted to show you this is the minimum standard for uh countries to meet that again uh you can go to this slide and you can go to this website it's on the final slide of my presentation uh so this is um in effect from April 19th, 2021, it's the minimum standard for the elimination of trafficking globally um, from the legislation um, put out there by uh, the United States uh, State Department. So I wanna talk about some of the challenges now, um, some of the challenges from a law enforcement perspective, some of the challenges from a community perspective and also from a prosecutions and government perspective as well. So, Julia, what I just want to quickly warn you, we're at the five minute mark. Um, okay. So Good. I'll let you know. Okay, no worries. Um, so these are some of the issues that, that we have with victims not reporting and victims not coming forward and also uh, lack of prosecution. So we've all heard of Stockholm Syndrome. We've heard of coercive control, very similar uh, elements that keep people in uh, domestic abuse situations are also similar. Um, elements that keep people in human trafficking and modern slavery situations. So undue influence, mind control, uh, coercive control, trauma bonding, where somebody connects to their abuser and couldn't leave even if they wanted to. They feel emotionally tied to that person. So trauma bonding, as uh, it may, be, may or may not be a term that you've heard, but in effect, uh, when there's no access to another source of comfort or protection, victims may turn towards their tormentors. So they will go and seek protection from the very person that is making their life a misery. And this allows the person, the perpetrator, to keep hold of that victim. And is, you know, if that person were to be challenged, um, they, would, they wouldn't they would even say that they were being victimized. Um, some people don't even recognize that they're being victimized. The challenges in terms of prosecution are uh, there can be a lack of co cooperation between law enforcement, um, between different law enforcement departments, different countries, different jurisdictions, lack of designated prosecutors, as we've mentioned. A big issue is criminalized victims. When we're dealing with prostitution, when we're dealing with people that are maybe cultivating illegal drugs, we're dealing with people that are recruiting other people. These people are criminalized and therefore when, the, when they come to the attention of the police, they themselves are treated as uh, perpetrators rather than victims. Um, a lot of countries don't really understand fully how to deal with somebody that is a victim, but also is doing this under the coercion or threats of somebody else. Um, we also have undocumented migrants. Uh, so again, the risk is that if they come to the attention of the authorities, they're going to be deported or they're going to end up in some horrific situation that to them may seem worse than what they're actually doing. It may also be threats to their family. Uh, if they get deported, it brings shame on their family. Uh, there are very, very complicated issues here. Uh, inconsistent legislation, lack of coordination, lack of resources. And something that we see quite often 
um, and this is a big problem, is that prosecutors will revert to more familiar charges. Rather than going through uh, human trafficking charges, they are more likely to go to uh, somebody living off the um, proceeds of crime or living off the avails of prostitution rather than prosecuting for human trafficking specifically. And that's often because it's a, it's a lack of understanding. Um, so we've mentioned this, I'm going real fast now. Um, and again, I will share my presentation to anybody that wants it uh, if, if we don't get through it all, which we likely will not. Um, so victims are typically criminalized. Uh, they're forced to uh, commit crime. And that's a way, a very quick and easy way to protect the abuser from arrest because they can throw the victim under the bus and they are the ones that the police, that come to the police attention. And often due to that coercive control, due to that Stockholm syndrome, they will not, uh, or due to fear, they will not um, reveal who their trafficker or exploiter is. So there are a number of recommendations and these recommendations actually come from the Trafficking in Persons report. Uh, this is a report published in 2020 for Canada specifically. So these are specific Canadian recommendations. However, there are recommendations for other countries. Um, I'll go through them real fast, uh, but I'm not gonna read through them. So uh, prosecute, traffickers as rather than so prosecuting them as traffickers rather than prosecuting them for something else uh, such as living off the avails of prostitution identifying victims so being more vigilant about recognizing the signs of human trafficking signs of modern slavery um, increased specialized services increased data collection around trafficking increased coordination and communication among federal provincial uh, provincial and territorial groups, um, proactive law enforcement techniques, particularly when it comes to forced labour. Canadian child sex tourism, it's not a big problem in Canada, Canadians are going to other places and are engaging in, in sex tourism and child sex tourism in other places. People know this, those Canadians can be prosecuted in Canada as well as those other countries. Um, so we need to increase our awareness of those Canadians or those people from one country that are going somewhere else. We can prosecute those people. So keeping a database or learning who those people are is important. Uh, changes to the criminal code to add trafficking and exploitation as specific elements, the way it is done in international law. Uh, increased funding, of course, increased training, of course, uh, particularly for prosecutors and judges, but also for law enforcement, and also looking at supply chains. Um, where are supply chains, where in the supply chains are we failing, and are people um, being allowed to be exploited further? Awesome. Thank you so much, Julie. Sorry <laughs> I had to rush you there a little bit at the end. It's fine. It's fine. It's um. I kind of knew I was pushing it a little bit. There. All good. So um, we will make sure to post Julie's slides um, at the bottom of her session. All of our sessions, with the exception of our keynote speech, will be or have been recorded and will be available to you um, to revisit and rewatch in your own time. Um, so be sure to check that out. And that's where you can find her slides as well. Um, we'll now head into another networking break, but be sure to tune back in at 2 p.m. for our final session of the day, which features an expert panel on officer mental wellness. You won't wanna miss it. <laughs>